Okay. How do I look? Am I positioned properly? Good. You do mostly my face or my like your from like your my big ass belly. <laughs> Do you want me to do this long or short? No. <laughs> it's got to be short. Long, long. Long. Oh, because it's um, it's it's a really long story. It's a big about most of my life in a way, you know, because I was involved in the arts when I was a kid, and a lot of the things that I did then sort of informed what I do now. I've been playing music since I was about eight. I played the drums. Well, when I was a kid, I was involved in like theater and and dance when I was a teenager. I was a great dancer. This was in the mid 80s. You know, when I was in my teens, I was really heavily involved in the, the hard, hardcore punk rock scene. Where well, I'm from Trenton, New Jersey. I used to put a music magazine out and I had a small record label. And I used to book shows, all ages shows. And so I was always kind of involved in uh, creative creativity and uh, creative communities my entire life mostly. As I grew up, uh, when I graduated from high school, um, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I didn't go to college initially, um, but after a year of not being in school, my mother kept nagging me all year saying, you should take some classes at community college. So I ended up taking some courses and, go, and, and realizing that uh, going to college would, could potentially be an opportunity for me to expand my life. Um, because I come from a more working class background and I would say it doesn't, education wasn't really that important. Um, so I ended up um, going to school in Oregon for a couple of years and then I came back here and I finished school in Montclair, New Jersey. And this whole time uh, I studied art and I was a humanities major and I studied visual art and I studied dance. So I like went to school for a while, dropped out, went back, finished, and I had a, got a fine art degree. And at some point in the whole time I was doing this, I was playing music. I continued to play music in punk rock bands and put out fanzines and just really be involved and immersed in underground culture, specifically punk rock culture, sort of uh, transgressive art culture and um, fanzine culture underground comics and around that, about the time I was 26 and I had moved back again to the East Coast and I was living in northern New Jersey, I started to curate shows out of bars. Specifically, um, kind of, I was looking a lot at underground comics, comics that were produced by um, publishing companies like Fantagraphics, very specific indie underground comics and um, self-published comics. And at the time, the New York Free Press, which was a free newspaper, I don't think it's around anymore, it was sort of a competitor to the Village Voice. It was the more underground version of the Village Voice. And they would uh, basically would have all these underground comic artists in, in the, or this weekly newspaper. I mean, I, I started to curate a lot of that type of underground comics, illustration. I was collecting a lot of children's books and following like the sort of illustration that was blurring the line between fine art and illustration. People I ended up working with later, people like Gary Baseman, uh, but other art, and people, the people who sort of started that were the forefathers of the sort of blurring of the line between illustration and comics where people like Gary Panter, Charles Burns, Art Spiegelman. There was a magazine, that, a comic that used to come out called Raw in the kind of late 70s, early 80s of this generation of artists who were doing the sort of graphic novel, but the sort of transgressive type work that was really tied into this sort of underground music culture that I was very much immersed in. So I started curating shows out of bars, and specifically the first bar I started curating out of was a bar in Hoboken, New Jersey called Maxwell's. It was considered like the best club in New York that wasn't in New York for like indie music. And I lived in Jersey City at the time, so I started to curate shows out of there, which eventually led me to curating shows out of Max Fish. My, my goal was to eventually curate shows at CBGB's gallery, which is where I ended up eventually. I curated shows out of there for about four years. But I would do alternative spaces because I didn't have any money. The kind of work I was showing people weren't interested in, really just a really underground subcultural group of people would be interested in that work. 
You know, I would have these openings at CB's, and we get like 600 people out. So we would, there was a, a big following, but people weren't buying art, and people were young, they were around my age, they were like 25, 26. And at that time, I, what I started to do was I was selling a lot of artists who sold prints, people like Frank Kozik, who was sort of considered the father of the second generation of like rock and roll poster art, and this artist Coop, and that's when I started to show Shepard Fair when he... He was influenced by Frank Coz and he started putting out his own silk screen prints. So I was showing this type of work because I could sell a print for $25, $35, $40 and people could afford that. So that was sort of my way of breaking in. But if I, I mean, I can remember having this show with Shepard there. And this was in 1998. And I had five pieces in the back that were like these three by four foot paintings. And they were $3,000 each and I couldn't sell them to save my life. That's kind of how I got started. It was never about it being lucrative. Um, I mean, when I was 30 years old, I, I'm 46 now. I was, so this is 16 years ago. Um, at the time, I was curating these shows. I was so broke, I was working all these part-time jobs. And I had about $20,000 in credit card debt, which to me was a ton of money. And I didn't really have any prospects for better work because I just wasn't good at working for other people. To me, like working at some job I wasn't into that wasn't going to be inspiring in some way or like where I, was, where I wasn't going to be contributing in a real way just was like death to me. It was like being in jail. So consequently, I, I, I never got work like that. But also consequently, I never had any money. So when I was 30, I moved back to my parents' house and I worked for a friend. And I was friends with these siblings that owned a bagel shop in Trenton, and I worked at a bagel shop for almost two years, making about $8 an hour. I was still curating on the side. Yeah, I was struggling. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, and during this time, I ended up developing and opening up Tin Man Alley, which was my first gallery, which was in a town called New Hope in Pennsylvania. And it, for 100 years, um, there was a landscape painter, a school of uh, landscape painters from the area, because it was so beautiful. So it had this history of being this artist community. Came became came more touristy, but it still is, exists as this sort of um, artist community, alternative culture type place. The band Ween is from there. It's really very accidental how I opened the first gallery. I mean, initially I was trying to help my mother open a business. We ended up opening this gallery, and it was a half a gallery, half a toy store. Because at the time, again, this work, selling this type of work wasn't lucrative. So I had to figure out another way to continue to support my, basically, my art addiction. My passion for something that really wasn't rational in some ways. I mean, now it's become this big thing, and, you know, street art and pop surrealism and all, and all this type of work is, it's, you know, become almost main, mainstream for art. And, uh, but back then, it was a very small group of people. And I think a lot of my friends, you know, I found out later people were, thought I was a little crazy for my obsession with it. But through some sort of accidents, I opened this um, gallery in New Hope, and it was in a basement. There were no storefront. And the way to get down to it is you had to walk down these two alleys on the sides of this building. And that's why we called it, we called it Tin Man Alley, because a lot of what I was selling besides the art was um, reproduction tin toys from like the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. It was like a nostalgic shop. I was selling all this kind of nostalgic type reproduction. Besides tin toys like home decor, clocks, pedal cars, things like this, I was just going to call it the Tin Man. But my stepfather said, you should call it Tin Man Alley. That sounds better. And he was making a play on the word Tin Pan Alley. Tin Pan Alley is an area of New York where all the um, these buildings used to be of all the song publishers up until like the 50s and 60s before the music industry was different. And my stepfather's in the music, so he's like, you should call it Tin Man Alley. So we call it Tin Man Alley. I was only there for two years. I mean, my plan had was uh, initially always from the start was when I left here, when I left north of New Jersey, Jersey City, my plan was to come back. Because I knew if I wanted to be competitive as a gallerist, I needed to come back to New York. I had thought in my head, maybe I'll open a gallery in Philadelphia, 
because I had been down there and I saw how this, the arts community was growing there, especially with places like Space 1026, which is a very influential artist collective. And I work with some artists who are from that collective. Um, and just how inexpensive the real estate was in comparison to New York. You know, I thought to myself, well, Philadelphia is, is one of the biggest cities in the country. That might be a good option for me. Um, but my plan was always to come back because I knew I was going to have to come back because New York is the Mecca. Um, 